My name is Eric Deggins, and I'm TV critic for National Public Radio, and I'm here with a couple of very esteemed authors. Uh, Christopher Caldwell, who's an American journalist, former senior editor for the Weekly Standard, and author of The Age of Entitlement, America Since the 60s. He's joining us from Washington, D.C. Uh, we've also got Thomas Frank, historian, journalist, former Wall Street Journal columnist, and author of The People Know, The War on Populism and the Fight for Democracy. He's joining us from Kansas City. I'm in St. Petersburg, Florida, and we're gonna make this, we're gonna make this happen through the magic of video chat. So thanks for joining us, guys. Really appreciate it. So it seems that your books in different ways are describing um, how we landed in this crazy political time that we're in right now, where we're tussling with trying to understand these movements and politics that some people at least have called populist. So what I'd like each of you to do is give us a thumbnail synopsis of your book and what it might say about whether or how America has sort of landed on the road to populism. And Tom, we're gonna to start with you. Um, and what do you think? Yeah, and, and here it's, it's more like the, uh, the railroad to populism. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is that I'm, I'm, I'm joining you from Kansas City, about 20 miles from where the word uh, populist was actually invented. Uh, it was invented by people to describe themselves, to describe a political party that they had just founded right here in Kansas. Uh, and it was the, sort of the last of America's great third party movements. And it was a um, pretty straightforward farmer labor party. It corresponded to the uh, uh, labor party in England, the labor party in Australia. It was a left-wing reform group, you know, came together, started here in Kansas, challenged the local Republican party. Kansas was a one party state at the time uh, then as it is today and uh, dominated by the Republican party. Anyhow, the populists had this very brief moment about five years in the sun nationally speaking, uh, challenged the economic system of the country. And then after the election of 1896, which I hope we'll talk about at some point, uh, they, they faded out. But the sort of populist tradition lived on. Uh, you see it resurfacing in periods like the 1930s with Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. You see echoes of it in the 1960s. You see echoes of it today in the Bernie Sanders campaign that just uh, that just concluded. But what the book is, what I what I uh, what I really focus on, and what came to fascinate me as I wrote this history are the people who have hated populism since the beginning. The people that I refer to as anti-populists. And as I, as I mentioned, populism was welcomed, well, maybe I didn't mention it, populism was welcomed into the world with this campaign of uh, sort of upper class hysteria, where the newspapers and the great capitalists and the, uh, uh, the academics and the society preachers came together to denounce this movement as um, you know, as, 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 as basically an uprising of the riffraff. It was, it was class war by the uh, unwashed and the uneducated, and it had to be suppressed. It had to be put down. And you see this same, and they describe them as mentally ill. They describe them as bearers of all kinds of pathologies. And you see this uh, critique of populism uh, in those days always came from the right, from the established, you know, from, from, from the uh, sort of uh, American financial establishment. But beginning in the 1950s, this uh, critique of populism, this sort of anti-populist vision, got adopted by what we would call the center left. And that is where it remains to this day. That's the people who use the word populism in this entirely negative sense, using the exact same stereotype that was invented back in the 1890s to suppress the original left-wing populist movement. Okay, so Chris, tell us a little bit about your book and how it may relate to this theme of America being on the road to populism. Right. Well, my book is um, a little more recent. It's a it's a history of the United States from um, from the Kennedy assassination in 1963 to the Trump election in uh, in 2016. Uh, and, and in the course of that, I describe actually what you could call the rise of, of populism. Fortunately, I think I, I share, um, Tom Frank's definition of, of populism almost exactly. Populism is a democracy movement, but it's a, it's a very specific kind of democracy movement that is not really captured very well by our spectrum of left versus right. 
It's the kind of um, democracy movement that arises in a very well-developed, well-articulated um, political system. It tends to happen in advanced political systems where you have a, a high degree of trust and a high degree of, of complexity, uh, which leads people to entrust a lot of the business of running government to judges uh, and regulators and experts of different kinds. So government gets run on the basis of, of kind of inside information, and distrust tends to grow. And populists tend to have the same solution, which is to return authority to the ballot box and take it away from, you know, boards and, um, and, and committees and uh, special uh, uh, groupings of the best citizens and give it back to the people. And obviously, I'd say we're living a ver version of, uh, of populism now. Okay. So, so Tom, you seem to be saying that um, the left in particular is misidentifying populism and that when it looks at um, Trumpism uh, in America, for example, um, it should be called something else. It should be called authoritarian conservatism or something like that. Um, but so let's just say you're right about that. Isn't the larger issue that we've got to grapple with whatever this is, this Trumpian, Johnson-y, Bolsonaro-y movement that seems to be winning elections in all these democracies? Oh, hell yes. So I, I've been writing about the uh, this this kind of the, the rebirth of the right for, for many years. You know, this is what uh, What's the Matter with Kansas was about. Oh, geez, way back when. And the, you know, you're talking in general about um, the disaffection of uh, working class people, specifically in this country, the white working class with the traditional party of the working class, the Democrats, and instead being uh, lured over to, uh, you know, to, to conservatism. And the, you know, the argument that I made back in What's the Matter with Kansas that was the sort of ironic one that, you know, they're, they're signing up for this party that has done them all manner of economic harm, uh, which is <laughs> true and is still true to this day, and it just gets worse and worse and worse every year. But the bigger question is why is this happening? And one of the reasons that I that I that I settled upon that I mentioned in What's the Matter with Kansas, but that I really elaborate in this current book, uh, The People Know, is that this is as much due to the uh, you know to the sort of the uh, the vision uh, presented to people by someone like Donald Trump or Ronald Reagan or Richard Nixon. As, but it's also due to the betrayal by the Democratic Party, you know, the traditional bearer, the traditional champion of working class interests, to their complete uh, turn away from the uh, populist tradition beginning in the late 1960s and going up through the 70s. And today that that is uh, that is utterly complete. And they've become the party that Christopher Caldwell was just talking about, the sort of the, the, the party that tells us that experts are always right. Uh, that bails out Wall Street, that ensures that you know monopolies never get broken up, that uh, elites help other elites, that there is this, as a uh, anti-populist theorist put it in the 1950s, that there is an affinity among elites. And that is really what the Democratic Party has come to stand for. I want to stop you right there because I would imagine some Democrats would say they press for um, voting rights, the extension of voting rights to everybody. Uh, to the end of voter suppression, the end of gerrymandering. There's, they're pressing for uh, greater insurance and, and uh, medical care to people, um, particularly uh -huh. through Obamacare. Um, how is that a reflection of supporting the elites? Well, now well, I think we get into a now, now I think we get into a into an area that's that's uh, that has certain overlap with with my book. Um, when you talk about uh, voting rights and, 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 and that sort of thing, you know, the, the civil rights legislation of, of the 1960s, which is a major theme that runs through my book over the last 50 years, um, it, did extend, it did extend democracy, but it also um, extended the oversight of, of the federal government um, uh, over America's de democratic life and it removed, particularly as time went on, more and more things from democratic uh, uh, consideration. So certain, when things become rights, 
they become things that you can't vote on. And uh, I, I think that from a, from a position of initial consensus around civil rights, the structures of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 were used for more and more things. They were used for things like uh, guaranteeing bilingual education or um, uh, 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 admitting women to men's clubs, different, different jobs than, than the original job of, um, uh, 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 of ending segregation in the South, at least as the country understood it. Um, and over time, I think that people felt that, that more and more was removed from their, their choice of how to run their lives. And if you, if you look at the latest example of this, which happened just a few weeks ago, as we record, would be the Bostock decision. There's now a set of rules about, um, uh, uh, about how to deal with, with gay and transgender people in the workplace that it's really no business of, of any American to decide. It's done. There's no, your opinion is not welcome on, welcome on that. And so it's a kind of a natural thing for someone who objects to that to say, yeah, I want this back at the ballot box and I want it taken out of the courtroom. That's the populist aspect of this. What strikes me about what you just said is if I'm somebody who believes, for example, that um, you know, children should be allowed to have romantic relationships with adults. And there's a law that says, I can't do that. Uh, theoretically, I am being prevented from doing something um, that could be attached to personal liberty. But society has decided that the harm that would be visited on that child is greater than my freedom to do what I want, have relationships with who I choose isn't mm -hmm. what you're talking about what society always does. Say that mm -hmm. your freedom to discriminate against um, homosexuals is outweighed by the uh, need to allow people who are homosexual to have the freedom uh, to work at jobs that they are qualified to work at. Yeah, you're right. It is what, it is what society uh, always does. It's exactly the same thing. The difference is in the way it does it. I mean, we have laws against, um, you know, uh, adults having relationship with chil with children in, 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 in this country, to use uh, to use your example. And they have been, you know, voted by legislatures. They're not the product of a, a of a decree. And so they do reflect whatever the, the consensus of the public happens to be at the time. I think it's the it's the it's the means by which the laws are are are, are brought about. Uh, rather than the, 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 the act of lawmaking itself. Well, I would say some of those laws actually have been voted. Um, you know, uh, laws um, sort of okay. prohibiting discrimination against um, homosexuals have been, have been voted into law. Um, they have been, well, but, that's, but a, that's I, a good, I, I, do, yeah. I do wanna, I do wanna give, I wanna give Tom a chance to talk because I'm sorry I cut you off. Go, go ahead, Tom, what were you gonna say? So you mentioned two different things, voting rights and, um, and Obamacare. The Voting Rights Act, you know, th this is a, obviously a triumph for populism. Populism was about the extension of the franchise to everyone, including they were the first party in the 1890s to demand votes for women. What you probably, and I, uh, I have a chapter of, uh, of, of the new book of, of the people know about uh, Martin Luther King calling it, you know, talking about populism and, and uh, the, the adventures of the civil rights movement uh, and their, uh, you know, People like SNCC, John Lewis, who just died, were had an extremely populist flavor to them. And what the the part of the story that most Americans don't know is where how how uh, blacks were disenfranchised in the first place, which is a fascinating story. Uh, and it happened in a lot of states in the South as a reaction to populism, because populism had tried in the 1890s to reach out to black farmers and say your class interest as farmers is the same as these white farmers. And if we rise up against the racist Southern aristocracy, you know, we can, we can do something uh, good for ourselves. And the racist Southern aristocracy rolled out, called at least in, in one state in North Carolina, the white supremacy campaign uh, in, order, in order to crush populism. And they succeeded. And that's and the, after populism was, was down, they uh, disenfranchised 
uh, a huge part of the Southern population. That's where it came from. They by when they when they beat populism. So of course, uh, you know, anybody that's true to the populist heritage is going to be in favor of that. But Obamacare is a different deal. That is elites looking out for elites. That is, you know, rather than having a universal health care system like they do in Canada or Australia or somewhere like that, they sat down with the insurance lobbyists and with the big pharma lobbyists and worked out a deal to, to give people some semblance of universal health care. And we've, we've had it now for a number of years and we can see, you know, it's weak points and it's not a great system, but it was designed to uh, ensure the uh, uh, profits of the insurance industry. I'm sorry, that's not how you build a national health care system. It's, it's a terrible way. It's putting, you know, it's completely backwards, but it is affinity among the elites, which is the definition of anti-populism. I think I think some Democrats would say it's it's what was possible. So my, my response as a political observer would be to say that Barack Obama, this is a man that came into office. I was a huge supporter. I was, you know, I was I had hope. And uh, I uh, I really believed in him. And that was a man who came into office with an unprecedented kind of support behind him. I mean, he had he had this country at his back and he he did not use uh, his power and his mandate in, in, in a way that he could have. He could have had, I think he could have had all sorts of things had he had he pushed for it. And he didn't, I think he was poorly advised. I don't, I mean, obviously he had, he was uh, fairly new to Washington, but I think he, he had, and I think by the end of his time in office, he understood how he got played. I mean, the Republicans, you know, incredibly good at obstruction, his own advisors, uh, really, really, you know, he he outsourced this thing to who is that senator from uh, South Dakota? I mean, it was a disaster from start to finish, and no, it it was not what was possible. It was, you know, it's it, he could have done any number of things. The man had extraordinary had an extraordinary mandate at that moment, and it uh, it, it is it is a tragedy what happened, in my opinion. So, I mean, there's, I don't want to get distracted into a conversation about that because I, I feel like you're eliding the fact that he took office when the economy was falling apart and their job one was to get the economy back on the rails and also try to get Obamacare passed before they lost yeah. uh, the control of, of, of Congress. And, and there were, and there were Democrats in vulnerable um, um, constituencies yeah. Uh, that would not let them advance the level of, um, you know, liberal uh, healthcare policy that I think they wanted to. But, but at any rate, yeah. I, I, I want to shift this conversation and, and talk a little bit about um, populism and 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 your critique of, of how the left talks about po populism, because it seems to me that that often when the left is talking about populism. They're talking about insincere appeals to populism, which you yourself have called, quote unquote, phony populism. And, and isn't it possible that when, um, you know, Democrats and liberals talk about populism, what they're really trying to talk about is the way that conservative politicians have tried to sell populism, tried to sell themselves as populists. This is for me. This is for you. Yeah, uh, that is that is absolutely right. But I wouldn't say sell themselves as populists. It's sell themselves as kind of uh, uh, working class heroes. And they've been I mean, this is explicitly the the, the, the thing you got to remember about the, all these Republican appeals going back to Nixon is that they are explicitly about social class. So at the very same move, moment that the Democratic Party was moving away from appeals to social class, you know, in the late 60s and in the 1970s, when the Democrats decided we want to identify ourselves with these enlightened kids on the campuses, with the professional uh, class, that sort of thing. At that very moment, the Republicans saw their opportunity. There's some very clever political players in the Republican Party, as we all know, and they they saw their opportunity and they stepped right in with uh, uh, with with appeals based on social class, but almost always on um, on questions of culture. So it begins with Nixon um, advised by Pat Buchanan uh, and it continues through Reagan, uh, you know, Newt King, the culture wars is the long history, but there's this hilarious quote uh, 
By the way, and all of these guys were described at some point as populists. They never would use the word themselves, but uh, Reagan was was uh, uh, constantly described as a populist in the early days of, of his presidency. And he would say things like, you know, I like to hang around with the, the people who have calluses on their hands. You know, he doesn't like to hang around with these phony, these Wall Street suits. But then, of course, what does he do as president? This is the, you know, the epic tale of deregulation, privatization, deunionization, and uh, you know, and, and tax cuts, you know. And so he, he, he helps to crush manufacturing and organized labor in America, but he's, you know, but at least he, he's, he's has this, you know, sunny way of speaking and he loves to hang around with people with calluses on their hands. So there you go. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, but, but again, uh, well, uh, I wonder if you're not faulting the left for trying to describe that. For trying to describe the, I'm false the I'm the one. That's my description. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but, but but when people say right wing populism, isn't it possible that's what they mean? So I'm not trying to be a kind of you know policeman about the word populism. My wife said when I started this book, you know, I'm from Kansas. I have this romantic attachment to the original populist, and she said, you know, Tom, the word is gone. Let it go. They've taken it. It's like you you can't control it. You know, just let it go. And she, you know, she's right. And I can't. That is true. But in the course of my studies, I came across this this aspect of it that is much more interesting, which is this the the, the notion of anti populism. And I really hope we can talk about this. The 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 sure. because it's not just that the word has been flipped. It has. You're right. How did it get flipped? Who flipped it? Why did they do that? And that's a really interesting story. I, I would I would disagree really that it's been flipped. Now, if we look at this, if we put co- uh, uh, populism in this context of expertise, when you have rule by expertise, you have a, a credentialed, educated ruling class who are quite homogeneous in terms of their, their thinking, their culture, and everything. They have things like there are people who understand, let us say, to take a present example, the uh, uh, infectiousness models that the Centers for Disease Control understand in a way that the average voter does not. And they come up with a set of rules um, that are going to have to be good for the public. And to go against those rules, actually, in the eyes of the ruling class, is actually to go against logic. It's to go against it's good to go against common sense. It's um, a, 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 and so a, a populist becomes a sort of like a lunatic, uh, 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 um, <laughs> and it's a, it's a very this is a very natural way for a ruling class in a in an expertise based state to look at the people who disagree with it. And I and 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 I think you saw that in the in the you know you see um, you see elements of that. In, 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 in the anti-Roosevelt um, forces in America in the 1930s, but you see it very strongly in the upper reaches of the Democratic Party today. Tom is right. Uh, another way to describe what you just described, though, would be to have a government where uh, the, the elected people, regardless of their elite status, um, employ a cadre of experts to help them run the country <laughs> And that when something like a pandemic happens, they actually listen to them, which is yes. what I think uh, Democrats would say they do. What Chris was saying is very true. OK, there's a lot of contempt for uh, sort of the lower orders in our political tradition. And yeah, the 30s was this extraordinary time for that. So was the 1890s. And it's back today. It's just it's shifted sides instead of being you know, like the American Liberty League in the 1930s, which was an extreme right. Uh, organization, it's the uh, it's it's the, the sort of center left now who who, ha- who expresses that contempt. Now, just to set the record cl- straight, the original populists did not dislike expertise. They understood their own movement as a kind of university educating farmers. They would have these like a Chautauqua. They'd have these giant gatherings where they'd bring in speakers from all around the country to uh, educate the farmers about economics, about the gold standard, etc. What they but the the educated elite of America, the sort of Ivy League you know, presidents of Ivy League universities, the leading economists and sociologists of that time, absolutely hated and despised populism and saw it as an uprising of the of the unwashed and the lower orders. 
because populism threatened orthodoxy, economic orthodoxy. Orthodoxy is the key concept here. Populism threatened the gold standard, which was uh, that was the you know that was the key to upholding the entire capitalist economy at the time, and many other things as well. Populism said government has to come in here and help us help out farmers, and someone like William Graham Sumner, the leading American academic of his day, a sociologist at Yale, was like, "Are you kidding me? The, the, you know what government owes to people who are suffering in hard times?" nothing zero you know <laughs> we owe you absolutely nothing and that and so it, it was this same conflict now here's what the, the story is very similar to that right up until the 1950s and then you have this extremely interesting twist and this is the sort of uh, the pivotal point in the narrative of, of how the word populist got flipped and there's a group of academics a school of academics they called themselves the consensus uh, you know, consensus intellectuals, or they were called the cons- it was the 1950s, the great era of, of consensus. And the sort of leading historian of his day was a man named Richard Hofstadter, wrote a book about populism called The Age of Reform. It came out in 1955. It was massively influential, won the Pulitzer Prize, has been described as the most impo- influential work of American history ever published. And he decided he, this was after World War II. He was had been much frightened by fascism, and he was much frightened by McCarthyism, which was ongoing at that time. And he wanted to look for the roots of these things. And he just decided, almost out of uh, thin air, that the, that the roots of these things were to be found in populism, in this farmer movement in the 1890s. And he went about uh, trying to prove that. And, uh, you know, he sort of cherry-picked evidence here and there. And he uh, basically used the exact same stereotype that Chris described a second ago, and that the opponents of populism had used in the 1890s that this was a irresponsible anti-intellectual movement of the lower orders who knew nothing who were paranoid who were backward looking who had all sorts of mental who were in the grip of mental illness but he added something to, to that he said they were anti-semites as well now all of this wow. uh hofstadter's hofstadter's uh, uh uh you know and some of them were and some of them were racist too this is the 1890s but hofstadter said they were the main uh, the, the, this was the main spring of anti-Semitism in American life, which is a preposterous accusation. It was ridiculous. And it was massively and overwhelmingly disproven within a very few years after his book appeared. And their, uh, Hofstadter's entire take on populism, this psycho history of the movement, was demolished by other historians in a very short amount of time, within 10 years. I mean, there are entire books written like refuting just single chapters of his work on populism. And I could go into that in detail, but you don't want to hear it. The important thing is this. When, when Hofstadter did this, he wasn't just writing a work of history. He was writing a manifesto for his generation of intellectuals. Okay, this is the 1950s, is the great moment of the managerial, you know, the, uh, the, the rise of the professional class into positions of power in the American hierarchy. All of a sudden, people with MBAs are running the great corporations. All of a sudden, people with PhDs are running the, uh, you know, the, the, the departments in Washington. Uh, you know, political scientists are running the Pentagon. It, the, the university system in America is expanding dramatically. This is a moment of triumph for the professional managerial class as a class. And he was writing a manifesto for that. And what Hofstetter's argument was is that you don't want mass movements of reform like populism they're dangerous there's something wrong when working class people get together they have all sorts of funny ideas they do they you know they don't get anywhere they don't really do anything same with the labor movement they don't ever achieve anything but when you get a whole bunch of people like me me and my friends you know ivy league uh, mbas phds etc and you put us in charge and you let us sit around the big mahogany table in washington and we come to decisions with one another consensus that's how you get reform. That's how you manage an economy. That should be the model going forward for liberalism. And so when he used the word, he used the word, he was looking for something to describe what he and his generation were displacing. And that was populism. And that his redefinition of the word totally caught on, even though it was uh, his historical vision was completely smashed. His definition of the word is the definition that we see nowadays when you open up the New York Times or the Washington Post or any European newspaper. It harkens back to Hofstadter. And I'm going to say one last thing and I'm going to shut up. There's now an entire pedagogy of this. They call it global populism studies. And it is a pedagogy based on a mistake. 
based on Hofstadter's complete misunderstanding of history. Well, I so, I have to say I I you know, I, I think uh, that I think that's a very good good summary. Um, I do think that though that there is a reason why people fear um, intolerance from populist movements and in particular anti-Semitism, and that is because there is an overlap. Um, perhaps not in a in a in a majority of cases, uh, between the populist idea of a remote elite and the anti-Semites idea of the same. So I I would agree with you, Tom, that 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 anti-Semitism is by no means the the dominant impulse behind 19th century populism. But there was a there was a a, a crossing of paths that I think probably other other movements did not have. So, Chris, I want to ask you, it seems as if you're saying in your book, uh, when you talk about the civil rights movement, that um, the changes that it brought, um, that the price that was engendered to American society from those changes was too high and created this um, group of disaffected Americans who have now, uh, you know, sort of become... um, the, the core of Trump's base. Am I oversimplifying what you've said? I, I think so. I think you're. I think you're overstating it uh, a bit. This is not. Um, this is not a defense of the system before the the Civil Rights Act. Um, it. I do not say the the price was too high. However, the system has proved. Um, the system has proved much more dynamic than what people thought they were they were getting. I believe that what most Americans thought that they were that they were buying into in the 1960s was a settlement, you know, a, a sort of a, um, a, a sort of like a reshuffling, a new deal that would then proceed into the future and on that basis. But it's turned out to be a very dynamic system. It's come to bring in. Um, it's come to embrace much, much more of the of the country than it did originally. Um, uh, it, it's come to embrace uh, more groups than it did originally, uh, and it's lasted. It's it's the 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 active uh, period of of rem- remediation. Let's say has lasted longer than people think. And so you do get this resentment out of that. You have a situation, and it interacts with the things Tom is talking about. You have a, a civil rights system, which, to speak in the most general terms, offers remediation, right? It has things like, it has led indirectly to, to busing for school integration. It has led directly to, to affirmative action. It creates all sorts of bureaucracies so that if you have a transgender person working in your company, you know, the, uh, there are uh, government authorities who take an interest into that, in that. That system covers pretty much all ethnic minorities. It covers women in theory. It covers gay and transgender people in theory. And that that blanket coverage, that, that's a sort of right, and it's a right that everyone has except for so-called straight white males, right? And that's where the overlap with the situation Tom describes comes in, because there is another hierarchy of rights and privileges, and that is the economy. And if you are um, a, um, a wealthy person, generally you have an interest in the system as it exists, whatever it may be. So you, in an economic way, in a private, you have the private means to make this system work for you. And that creates a wedge of people who are not covered by their own private means, and they're not covered by this new government project, which are the white working class. And and that is, I think that we would, would probably all agree, that is the central locus of populist energy in the country right now. So I, I would imagine that people who disagree with you would bring up two ideas. Number one, the idea that all of this 
uh, bureaucracy that you're talking about that reaches out to these other people, the whole point is to give them an equal amount of opportunity as the white person has. So it's not about advantaging them. It's about trying to figure out a way to give them an equal shot at success in society, number one. Number two, um, there's that old saying that when you are privileged, equality feels like oppression. And isn't it uh, inevitable that people who have been in a situation where they were allowed to take advantage of the GI Bill when black people weren't, they were allowed to vote for hundreds of years when black people weren't. They were allowed to own businesses and own homes in desirable areas when black people weren't. That equalizing all of that and creating the bureaucracy that's necessary to equalize all that would feel to some people like they're being disadvantaged when really they're just being made. Yeah, well, you know, there are a couple of things there that are, that are, that are worth unpacking. One is the, you know, there is the question of inherited, um, in, you know, inherited guilt. And um, in literal terms, there's no one who's under the age of 75. There's no white person under the age of 70 or 75 today who was himself voting when black people weren't. So we, that takes us onto a different level of, of cultural responsibility and historic responsibility. In general, I do take your point about a system looking very different to um, those who benefited from it and those who suffered. So, so Tom, I wanted to come to you. And um, so it, it seems to me like what you're saying is that um, the people who critique po populism in the modern day um, are are advocating this idea where the, the elite would run things. And if you, if, you, if you really had a populist system where the average person had a lot of control, that that would be terrible for the country. Um, and, and, and one way that you talk about this is you talk about how Obama talked about um, his political opponents clinging to guns and religion. And you talk about how Hillary Clinton referred to Trump supporters as deplorables. And, and, and my question is, isn't it possible that they were talking about this pseudo populism that we've already kind of identified? You know, I I, admi I voted for and admired both of them. And I think Hillary Clinton realized what a mistake she'd made, what a blunder that was to call people deplorable. She realized that immediately uh, and tried to, you know, tried to backtrack out of it. What really got me was that after she said that, you know, and then, uh, I mean, the, the country was already in a state of hysteria about or the sort of uh, bien pensant reaches of America were in a sort of state of hysteria about Donald Trump already by that point and uh, continued down. The, I mean, it, we're in what I call a democracy scare now with this sort of traditional, this recurring uh, fear that the, you know, the people, uh, the, the, the mob, you know, the French Revolution is, is coming in some crazy way. It's a, it's a recurring theme in American culture. But uh, after Hillary backed off from that, there's this, you know, uh, and I quote many of these sort of pundits and intellectuals who, who are like, no, that's exactly right. You know, we should never forgive people who voted for Trump. There's no excuse whatsoever. If you voted for Trump, there's something wrong with you. You know, there can be no rational reason for voting, you know, on and on. And we've all heard this many, you know, dozens and dozens of times. The funny thing is now we have uh, in the aftermath of that 2016 election, it's like we've gone entirely the other direction in the in the left and the center left, where it's just all about uh, purging and canceling and kicking people out. And it's as though we're on some kind of reality TV show where everybody thinks they're going to be the the uh, they're going to be the, the most righteous one and they're going to win the prize and they're going to be the last one left on the island, you know, <laughs> the island of historical righteousness. And it's a it, it's <laughs> we're going in entirely the wrong way is what I want to say. I, I don't know, because it seemed to me that the that the primary, the Democratic primary was about centrists like Biden uh, up against people like Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders who claim to, to be more populist. And it, and, it, and it seemed as if the question before the Democratic Party was which strategy would be best to win the White House in November. 
And that to me yeah. doesn't sound yeah. like canceling populism. It sounds like considering populism. No, that's a very good point. And and you're right. And the Democratic primary is 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 sort of different than the movement culture that I'm that I'm describing here. I mean, Biden, in my view, has a lot to answer for. You know, when you talk about like the the, the arming of these police forces, the you know, the uh, mass incarceration of black people, this is this is this is Biden. And he has never atoned for that, or at least not satisfactorily, in my opinion. On the other hand, and there's a lot of other things you can criticize him for, and Lord knows I have. He was on on board with every lousy trade agreement, you know, the uh, the bankruptcy bill during the Bush years, all of these things. You know, Biden has a lot to answer for. On the other hand, Biden will never call people deplorables. That's a mistake he will never make. There's this very interesting moment. If you go back and read the New York Times editorial boards, interviews with the different candidates and they're extremely boring and there's no reason in the world why you would ever read them but i did okay and <laughs> biden actually has this very interesting moment very interesting exchange with the new york times editorial board where it's all it goes on for like an hour and a half and it's extremely boring you know by all just politician nonsense you know but then he says they get to talking about the 2016 election and he says that some um you know, Hillary operative, some operative from the Clinton campaign came to him and said, uh, you have to, Biden, you have to distinguish between progressive values and working class values. And Biden is like, what do you mean? You know, working class people are some of the finest progressives you'll ever meet. And he turns to the New York Times editorial board and, and he gets it exactly right. It's, it's this weird moment of clarity for him where he says, you know, we in the Democratic Party, we think it's all about people like you, the smart people, you know, who can write so well and are, you know, so such wonderful, you know, wonderful command of the language. But in fact, these working class people for whom you have such disdain, you know, if you talk to them in the right way, they can actually be far more progressive than you are. And he was right about that. Now, whether he'll ever follow through, whether that means anything to him, who knows? But he won't make that, at least I don't think he'll make that same mistake that Hillary made. Now, this will come up. He sounds, like sounds, like <laughs> sounds like a popular. sounds like a popular. So, so if we could ask each of you uh, to sort of talk about what you think American ingenuity uh, means to you, and particularly as regards your book, and this idea of populism, if you can connect them both. And Chris, would, would you be willing to start? Well, sure. I, I you know, I, I, I think I have a, a, a pretty common uh, shared idea of American ingenuity, which is that it, it, it is mostly a matter of institutions, allowing people to shape institutions that will, will suit them. And, and um, it is the one area in which we've been um, in which we've been uniquely ingenious, I think, among uh, uh, among um, Western civilization, um, and or uh, uh, well, let's say among 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 Western governments, and 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 it seems to be failing us a little bit now, but it's not too late to get it back, maybe. And 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 Tom, what would you say about American ingenuity? So the, the populists had this really wonderful, the original ones in the 1890s, this really wonderful understanding of education and expertise, which is that it, 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 it had to be, it couldn't just be a handful of PhDs in, in Eastern cities. Education and expertise had to be spread far and wide to every little hamlet in town in Kansas, the Dakotas, etc. And there was a publisher. They loved uh, publishing uh, cheap paperbacks, cheap left-wing tracts, this kind of thing. And there was a publisher that came up in Kansas in the 1920s. Uh, again, a popular, a sort of populist. Uh, uh, he he, had, he ran a newspaper called The Appeal to Reason, which had been populist. Then it turned socialist, and then it went out of business. And he said, "Well, what do I do with this printing plant?" And he basically invented the paperback book. They, they called them little blue books. They were, it was about mass education. They cost a nickel. And he did sort of the great works of Western literature and these tiny little, you could buy them from vending machines. Hobos used to carry them around and read them on trains. Studs Terkel talks about seeing them all the time in his, in his childhood. And it was, it was this amazing campaign for mass education. And he said, we have forced open the doors of, high, of learning so that everybody in America can participate in this. And the, the, the uh, I'm, I'm going to screw up the quote here, but the, you know, the right to have a strong personality is open to everyone, thanks to our publishing methods. And I love that. And that's populism. That's Kansas. 
There you go. Hey, I want to thank both Christopher Caldwell, uh, author of The Age of Entitlement, America Since the 60s, and Thomas Frank, author of The People Know, The War on Populism and the Fight for Democracy. I appreciate, I appreciate you guys. Let me push back against you a little bit here. I thought we had a really spirited discussion. And uh, I want to thank the folks at the National Book Festival for hosting this panel. Thank you so much. And and please stick around and enjoy uh, all the other panels that we're going to offer you here at our virtual National Book Festival. Thanks a lot.